In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We thank our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for another Bible preach session on this blessed Friday evening, 7 p.m., all the way from Sydney, Australia. For those who are with us here in this holy church and those who are watching us through live streaming, we pray that you're always in good health and in good spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, Amen. If I could ask everyone to stand for the Lord's Prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgave our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Psalm number 79. O God, the nations have come into your inheritance. Your holy temple they have defiled. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. The dead bodies of your servants they have given as food for the birds of the heavens. The flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. Their blood they have shed like water all around Jerusalem. And there was no one to bury them. We have become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to those who are around us. How long, Lord, will you be angry forever? Will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not know you and on the kingdoms that do not call on your name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. Oh, do not remember former iniquities against us. Let your tender mercies come speedily to meet us, for we have been brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name, and deliver us and provide atonement for our sins. For your name's sake, why should the nations say, Where is their God? Let there be known among the nations in our side the avenging of the blood of your servants, which has been shed. Let the grounding of the prisoner come before you. According to the greatness of your power, preserve those who are appointed to die and return to our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach with which they have reproached you, O Lord. So we, your people, and sheep of your pasture, will give you thanks forever. We will show forth your praise to all generations. And all glory be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Well, a very good evening to everyone. How are we? How are we? That's the way. We thank the Lord Jesus for another Bible Preach Sessions. We are continuing last week's uh, commentary on the book of Revelation, and we'll read again what we read last time and we'll continue. So it is Revelation 11, 15 to 19. Revelation chapter 11, verses 15 to 19, inclusive. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail, and all glory, be to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever and ever. Amen. All right. Now, last week we were talking about 
the um, seventh angel sounding the trumpet. And we said the seventh trumpet is the second return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are really getting closer and closer to that second return as time is going by. From all the signs, the things that are happening around us on a global level, um, it is actually indicating that we are in deep into the end of times and could be very well the second return of the Messiah. We spoke about um, the, uh, the, the day uh, of, of the Lord, and we said the day is divided into three parts. There is the day of Christ, or the day of Jesus Christ, or the day of Jesus the Lord. All those three are to do with Christ. And there is the day of the Lord, and there is the day of God. The day of Christ is when he comes and takes his bride, the beloved church, into the Father's house, perfect, without a blemish, without a blemish, without a stain. The day of the Lord, when he comes and fights against the Antichrist and the beast, Satan, and throw them into the river of fire. And the day of God, we said, where we hear this voice saying, a new earth and a new Jerusalem, where we reign forever and ever in his uh, holy presence. Now, verse 15, then the seventh angel sounded and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. There will come a day, and we spoke about that day, where all the kingdoms of the world will be of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. No more people say, I don't believe in God. No more people saying, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, who is God. No more. He will reign forever and ever. Everyone will come to this realization. Now, verse 16, and the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we spoke about the 24 elders, I'm not going to go there. We give you thanks, these are the 24 elders saying this, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is and the one who was and the one who is to come because you have taken your great power and reign is was and is to come this is the holy trinity is was and is to come the holy trinity because you have taken what you have taken great power and reigned in this particular verse it is talking also about jesus christ of nazareth who was from the very beginning with his father who is present in his holy church by his holy spirit and who is to come in, on his second return this is the messiah now why it is the messiah because it is saying that you have taken great power and reigned this is in reference to christ why this time he has taken great power because in his first coming he did not have this great power why because not everybody believed in him. He came as the Lamb of God. And as the Lamb, he is very peaceful, he is very calm, he is very quiet, he is very, very weak and fragile. And I forgot to ask my dear Nora to sing. You'll sing twice at the end. I'm getting old. I just turned and I saw my beloved daughter. Please forgive me. Um, so in his first coming he did not have all that power that's why the Lord Jesus when they came to capture him at the garden of Gethsemane he said this is your hour and the power of darkness this is your your authority now you see my first coming I'm, I did not come forcefully with mighty power and force with me. I came with mercy. I came with mercy and I begged everyone to repent and come 
and embrace the Savior and the Redeemer of the world. So in my first coming, I gave you the choice. But you chose darkness over the light. The light came into the world and people chose darkness over that light because their deeds were evil. They didn't want to come to the light for their evil deeds to be lest be exposed. That's why they loved darkness to hide their evilness. In other words, people did not want to repent of their wickednesses. They, they were not ready to give up on their lustful lifestyle. And until this day, why are people denying God's existence? For one reason, because to them God gets on their conscience and gives their conscience a hard time. They don't want to give up on their pleasureful life. They want to do things their way. They don't want to go to God for him to come back and say, don't go there. Don't mix with this person. Don't drink. Don't drive this fast. Don't eat this way. Don't dress up in this way. God is too much. He is suffocating me. I want to be free. So the only way to give my conscience a break, I'll say there is no God. It is easier to deny God's existence than for me to give up on my lustful life in order to please God. That's why they chose darkness. And until this day, people are choosing darkness. Not that light doesn't exist. Everybody knows light exists. But they're choosing darkness because they don't want nobody to see their evil doings. They do everything in hiding behind closed doors, in secrets, in dark little alleys somewhere downtown, brother. No, you are the children of the light. You need to come to Christ. Darkness will do you no good. Darkness will destroy you, kill you eventually. Darkness is poison. Darkness is deception. Darkness is destruction. So the Lord said, my first coming, I did not have this mighty power because I came with mercy. I came begging for your love, knocking at the door of your hearts, hoping that you will do open the door. But on my second return, I'll come with mighty power. I'm going to reign. No more, Mr. Nice Jesus. No more. No more the lamb. In his second return, he'll be the roaring lion. He'll be the mighty king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. My goodness, if you think Satan is powerful, wait until you see the power of Christ. Satan is nothing. You can step on him in the name of Jesus. He is absolutely nothing. Christ, on his first coming, stripped Satan from his authority and power for as long as you and I choose to be under the umbrella and the shadow of the Almighty Jesus Christ of Nazareth. For as long as you live under his protection, you can step on Satan, no problem. You walk away from Christ, Satan will play with you like a soccer ball as they do in Qatar as we speak. He will shoot you all over. So, who is saying you have taken mighty power and reigned the 24 elders? Who are the 24 elders? The church of Christ. Where are they as they speak? In heaven. So if somebody says saints are dead, they don't pray, they don't say nothing, you're mistaken. The 24 elders are praying and saying, glory to you, Lord Jesus, for you have come with mighty power and reigned. So it looks like these saints are living and they're praying. They are in the presence of the Lord. They are sitting around the throne of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who is God revealed in the flesh. 
And we'll come to it more. So now you're coming with a great power to reign, conquer, rule. Those who belong to Christ will rejoice, but those who reject Christ will be angry because the, the last thing they want is for the Lord Jesus to reign with power. The last thing they want. Why? Because they followed Satan. Satan hates Jesus yeah, with a passion. That's why he will hate anyone and everyone who follows Jesus. He will hate you because he hates your master. You know why he hates the Lord? He is the only human in a human form that crushed the head of the serpent. As a human, the only one who overcame Satan is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, the son of the carpenter. Through his humanity, crushed the head of the serpent. His divinity did not interfere. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been a fair battle. He engaged in a battle against Satan with humanity only. Divinity did not interfere. And with humanity in its weakest form, nailed on the cross, shredded to pieces, about to die, extremely weak, in that deepest weakness of the human form, he crushed Satan so powerful in his own dominion. He crushed Satan. That's why Satan cannot stand the name of Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua. Yeshua in Hebrew, Yeshua in Syriac or Aramaic. Same. Yud, equivalent of E, for Yahweh. Shaw means Savior. That is a Hebrew name, by the way. Yeshua or Yeshua is a Hebrew name, means Yahweh the Savior. Compounded word. So, 24 elders are the saints, are the followers of Christ. They are, the, they are the, the church of Christ in heaven. So what are they doing? They're rejoicing because their master finally is coming with mighty power to reign. About time, Lord, show him, teach him a lesson for all those secret societies. Teach a lesson to Satan that he thinks he can do anything and everything and get away with it. No, there is a time the Lord will judge you can kill people, but you cannot get away with murder. You can poison people with jabbing them, but you cannot get away. Whatever poison you've put in people will come back and haunt you. And you will not escape the wrath of God. Never. For God is fair and God is the right judge. He will judge you fairly and squarely. And no one escapes God's judgment. No one. The angels couldn't. Do you think the piece of dust human race can? Come on. Satan knows this. That's why he comes in a very sneaky way. And he says, come on, you only live once, brother. Let's go downtown. You only live once, my dear, my dear girl. Do whatever you want. This is your body. No one can tell you what to do with it. You have, no one has the permission to come and tell you how to live. You do as you please. Satan comes in a sneaky way. At the beginning, it sounds so sweet. It sounds so beautiful. It sounds so absolutely right. But in that sweetness, he hides his poison. He hides his poison. Don't ever fall for that trap. My brother, my son, my daughter, be careful. Be careful, I beg you. The world is very tempting. I must say, it's very tempting. But in that temptation, there is poison. It will kill you at the end if you follow with it. It will kill you.
Be very careful. No matter how good your friend is in your eyes, when he says to you, let's go and have fun, say no. My fun is with the Lord. My fun is not in those dark alleys in the city. My fun is not in that Star City Casino. My fun is not with drinking, gambling, and, and everything else. My fun is with the Lord. My fun is with the Lord. My son, my daughter, I beg of you, don't ever be deceived. Look what Jesus wants from you. Please, his beautiful heart, his sacred heart, his holy, the light of the world, and the life of every human being. Please the Lord, my beloveds. Please the Lord. Those who belong to Christ will rejoice because the Lord finally is reigning with mighty power. But verse 18, the nations were angry. Of course, those who are against the true divine God, of course they're going to be angry because when the true divine God, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth, when he comes and reigns, they can't do whatever they wish anymore. It's against their way of living their way of thinking. So of course they'll get angry. They were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. The time of the dead that they should be judged. I'm going to read to you, it's not on the screen, but I'm going to read to you this verse from 1 Thessalonians 4 and verses 16 to 18 inclusive. It's not on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 18. This is St. Paul talking. And please focus on the word dead. Verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With, a vo with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God. Verse 16 is talking about the seventh trumpet. Revelation 11, 15 is 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. They go hand in hand. St. Paul is talking about for, uh, Revelation 11:15. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. The trumpet of God is the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet. What is going to happen? And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words so when the sounding of the seventh or the last trumpet the dead in Christ will rise first so look at this the nations verse 18 the nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead so there is the dead and there is the dead in Christ Two different categories. There is the dead. Here, John the Beloved is saying the dead will be judged. But here, St. Paul is saying the dead in Christ will rise first to be with him. Now, here is my answer to everyone that says the saints are dead. They don't hear us. They don't see us. They don't pray for us. Unfortunately, so sad, some people claim to be Christians but have this understanding and this belief that when someone who belongs to Jesus Christ departs from this world and goes to paradise, they are dead because St. Paul says they are dead in Christ and the dead do not hear, do not talk, do not walk. A dead is a dead person, that's it. 
They come to a full halt. So they say the saints are dead because they are dead in Christ. That's what St. Paul says. Wow. They don't hear us? Amazing. Obviously, it is not true. We need to come back to the apostolic teachings, not any teachings, church fathers' teachings that have been received from the 12 apostles of Christ, whom they received from the mouth of the Master himself, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We need to come back to the true teachings, my beloved. There is the dead, and there is the dead in Christ. The dead will be judged, but the dead in Christ will rise first to be with him forever in his holy presence, rejoicing in his holy presence. St. Paul in his epistle to the Romans says the wage of sin is death. Correct? The wage of sin is death. Now, these are the dead, meaning these are the people that rejected Jesus Christ. The nation were angry. The nations were angry because Jesus reigned. So these people chose to live in sin. These people chose to live in darkness. The wages of sin is death. So these are dead in their sins. This, what you call a dead person, truly dead. When they are living in sin, the unrepentant soul is a truly dead person. Why? Because when Adam broke God's word in the Garden of Eden, something happened. There is two kinds of deaths. There is the biological, physical death, and there is the spiritual death. The biological, uh, physical death is when the spirit departs from the body, separates from the body. This is called a biological, physical death, when the spirit leaves the body. But there is one death that is forever. This one is temporal. When the spirit leaves the body is a temporal death. But when the spirit leaves the creator, that's when that person is truly dead. When the spirit separates from the creator, from God himself. When we sin, our spirit separates from God. This is the true death. To this kind of a person you call a dead person. But those, according to St. Paul, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, they are dead in Christ. Everyone who is dead in Christ is living. Everyone who is dead because of sin cannot live. Are you guys cold? Is the air con? No? You okay? Good. Because I saw you sitting like that. I thought maybe you're freezing. <laughs> I'm wearing a tent. I don't feel it much. <laughs> Dead in Christ. When St. Paul talks, you, we need to pay attention. <laughs> the way he speaks is extremely deep. You can't take it at a surface level. It's very deep. Now, who is dead in Christ? A saint. Now, who is a saint? If I ask anyone... What is a saint to you? When you hear the word saint, what do you think of first? Naturally, at a very sort of nutshell, in a very simplistic approach, when you hear the saint, you say, well, a saint is someone that does miracles and raises the dead and does wonders and mighty powers. Now, to me, that's a saint. But really, a saint is not someone that raises the dead, heals the sick, and does wonders and miracles. That's not a saint. A saint literally is someone who is not earthly. And the Greek word, and I have a couple of people here that are very well informed and educated in the Greek language, therefore I need to watch what I say, and please correct me if my pronunciation um, is not as 
good as, as it should be. Agios in Greek is a compounded word. Agi means not, yos, earthly. So agios means not earthly, but agios is for the Holy One, the saint or the Holy One. It is referred to God, the Holy, and those who are godly following God, they become godly, they are also holy. So a saint is agios, meaning not earthly. A saint is not defined or determined by just raising the dead and healing the sick. Judas Iscariot healed the sick, cast demons out of people. He did miracles and wonders in Jesus' name, and at the end, he failed. So just by raising the dead and doing wonders and miracles, that does not guarantee that you'll end up a saint. But what will guarantee you to be a saint with the Lord forever when you and I become not earthly? What does it mean, not earthly? Meaning, I walk on earth, but I live with Christ. I am here on earth, but my heart is with the Lord. I'm physically going and coming, but my mind, my soul, my whole being is dwelling with the Lord in the heaven of all heavens. Now, this is a saint, a person of character. In the church, outside the church, the same person. Not in the church, one thing outside something else. No, a saint is someone who is not earthly, meaning wherever you are, whatever you do, you are all doing it for the Lord. When you are not earthly, you are imitating the angels. Now, angels are not earthly. What do angels do? They worship God always, not sometimes. They adhere to his word always, not sometimes. They are in his holy presence always, not sometimes. Sometimes we are sheep and sometimes we are goats. When I listen to Christ, I'm a sheep. When I disobey Christ, I become a goat. Sometimes I'm in his light and sometimes I'm in the club in the darkness of Satan. But angels are always in the presence and the light of the Lord. When you become a saint, you end up being like an angel. Not earthly. So who is dead in Christ? That person that becomes not earthly. St. Paul says, dead in Christ, it means... I have died to my old person completely in order for Christ to live in me completely. This is a dead person in Christ. When I died to the old Adam, the one who is the troublemaker, the one who breaks God's word and disobey, the one who became a goat that never listens to the shepherd, When I die to that old person, no more the flesh takes me wherever, makes me do whatever, no more. Next time the flesh wants to go to the club, I'll say, shut up, be quiet. I'm dragging you to the church. Next time the the body says, I want to use a foul language, I'll say, shut up. I will drag you to the church and I'll praise the Lord through you. Next time you want to steal, you want to break, you want to fight, no more. I surrender to the Lord. I want to be that vessel of glory for His holy name. I want the Lord to use me from now on. I don't want the world to use me and abuse me anymore. I want Jesus to use me for his glory and his holy name's sake. When you die to your old person, then you are dead in Christ. When you live to your old person, you are dead to your own self. You are detached from Christ. When you live for yourself, you're dead. 
when you live for Christ, you are dead in Christ. Because the only way for Christ to live in you and me, we need to die to the former Adam in order the latter Adam, Jesus Christ, to live in us fully. Why some people were able to do more than others? Because those people who did more and achieved more than others, they gave up on their life and on themselves more and more. They effaced, they erased themselves, they diminished for Christ to be augmented in them, to be magnified in them, to be seen more and more. The more you die to yourself, the more Christ lives in you. And the more Christ lives in you, then you can only say, I am living. It is impossible for someone to be dead in Christ and be dead. Because when you are in Christ, you are in the one who is the source of life. How can you be in the one who is the source of life and say, I'm dead? It's just impossible. Christ is life. When you are in him, you're living, but not living for yourself, living for him. That is the only way to live. When you live for Christ, not for yourself. Those who rejected Christ, they got angry and the dead will be judged by him because they chose to remain in sin, living in sin. But those who are dead in Christ, they are the true living people of God. Those who are in paradise are truly living. They, through, through the grace of God, through the grace of the Lord, they can see us, they can pray for us, they can help us, everything through the Lord, everything. But they cannot be dead because they died in Christ they died to their old sinful nature in order to live in this holy, perfect nature of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I don't know, are you with me? Yes. So next time somebody says, a saint is dead, say yes, but can you please continue and say dead in Christ, not just dead. Because dead and dead only, you're referring to a sinner, not a saint. But dead in Christ, now you are referring to a saint, not a sinner. So since you are sin free, you cannot die because death only has authority over sin. And this is the order of God. God gave authority to death to conquer whoever sins. So what came from God, only God can take away, no one else. So when we sin, we're dead. But when we become sin free, we are dead in Christ. And since we are sin free, there is only one thing for us to do is to live because death cannot conquer over someone who is sin free. Why did Jesus rise from the dead? For one simple fact, Jesus never sinned. But why did he die in the flesh? Because he was carrying our sins. Because he carried our sins, he needed to die because of our sins being carried on his shoulders. But the reason why he must have risen from the dead, because he himself never sinned. Death cannot conquer over someone who is sinless. When you are dead in Christ, you're sin free. Therefore, you can only live. Death has no place there. Some of you love it. Saints are alive. We are the dead ones because we still sin in this sinful and corrupt uh, nature that we have obtained after the fall of Adam. And besides, I know saints live. We need to grow up. We are living at a time and age, even inside the church and outside the church, some people have become extremely childish in their way of beliefs, in their way of thinking, and in their way of behavior. Very childish. 
Some Christians are acting like little kids, yet they should have been more mature. Or someone in spirituality is still a baby, yet they claim to be mature. If you haven't reached that spiritual level, don't be an adult. Say, I'm an, I'm an infant. It is not shameful to profess and confess the truth. If you're a baby in spirituality, say it. Why are you claiming something you're not? Have you lived in the desert? Have you lived in the wilderness by yourself alone? Have you lived in total darkness for years alone? You're living in an air conditioned home, in a very comfortable bed. In winter, it's heated. In summer, it is cooled. You have food on the table. You have the fridge to cool the water. You have the microwave to, it's not good, but use it sometimes, doesn't matter. You have the microwave to heat things for you. You sit in a car, air conditioned, remote control, everything. And then you're saying, you know, Jesus, please, please, we need to grow up. Jesus cannot be known that easily. If you think you know him that easily, very dangerous. Saints who reached high level of spiritualities, they were so afraid of saying, I know Christ, because this could have brought pride, false glory to their heads. Satan would have devoured them no matter how big in their spiritual stature they've reached. Satan can devour even the mighty saints if they are not careful. Nowadays, you hear people saying, I prayed and Jesus came and said to me, do this. And the Holy Spirit descended and told, what is, do you think, uh, where are you living? Don't be so comfortable, huh? Don't be. This is not the Lord. I can show you. Yes, the Lord hears you. The Lord reaches out to you. But the Lord is not that easy as you make it. Satan can come. You have to be careful. I'll tell you a true story. <laughs> I'll tell you a true story and then I'll rush. I'll breeze through it. I'll have to finish it. A true story. This monk was living in this monastery. It's a true story. It happened a few years ago. I won't mention where. Anyway, Satan appeared to him in a form of an angel. He can, by the way. And you won't even tell if it's an angel of God or not. He will come as an angel. See, when the Lord does not reveal certain things to you, you know why? Because we're still drinking milk in a dummy. St. Paul said, I'm still giving you milk. I haven't given you solid food because you don't have teeth. You're not adults. You're still baby in, in your spirituality. That's why I'm giving you milk. So don't jump and be an adult. He's still drinking milk. Today, babies drinking milk are saying we are adults. Very dangerous. That's why they have destroyed the true teachings. They've destroyed it. So this Satan appeared to this monk as an angel. He said, the Lord Jesus sent me to you. Blessed are you, the chosen one of the almighty Jesus of Nazareth. The, uh, the, the monk got up. Wow. Why? He said, the Lord loves you more than every other monk in this monastery. The language is not Christ's. The Lord loves everyone equally. The Lord loves you more than everyone. He has chosen you. He will take you up to heaven like Elijah. 3 a.m. This morning, 3 a.m., when everyone is asleep, you go on the rooftop. The chariot of fire that took Elijah to heaven will come and take you up to heaven like Elijah. You'll ascend living, not dead. This monk got up, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Look at me. Look at me. I am a saint. I am the holy one. I am so faithful. I have surpassed all my other brethren in this monastery. 3 a.m. He goes on the rooftop, very dark night, early in the morning. It's quiet. Nobody around. 
and he sees the chariot of fire coming down. This is a true story. This you're not going to see in your comfortable sofa and bed. <laughs> you need to give up on a lot of things. Christ doesn't come easy, my beloved. He's too expensive to come easy. He went up and he sees this chariot of fire coming down. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord. I'm going up. I'm a saint. Yes. Pulls right next to that rooftop and then they say to him, jump. He, he comes to jump into the chariot, disappears. I don't know how many stories. Mm, all the way to the ground. His body, the bones were all broken. But the mercy of Christ still reached him, saved his life. If he had died, he would have gone with sin pride that would have sentenced him straight to hell like that angel who became the saint uh, who became satan what made that angel fall self glory he fell to the ground every bone in his body was broken but still survived and he's still living that monk he repented and he said i've learned my lesson lord i will never rise above what i'm worth Lord have mercy on me if the Lord comes and says you're a saint say I am nothing but your humble servant Lord I'm nothing but a sinner but let it be unto me as you say like the the sweetheart of all sweethearts the mother of our Lord and God Mary when the angel the archangel who stands in the presence of God himself he came blessed are you or favored one full of grace what did she say I am the hand maiden of the Lord she didn't boost about that she didn't say wow look at this God chose me over every other girl hallelujah I'm the holy one now I will be the mother of this God no she said I am a hand maiden of the Lord a handmaiden and she lived to that all her life on earth because she became the handmaiden and chose to live in humility today she is exalted above every saint and every angelic order in heaven she is the queen sitting at the right hand of the king my goodness Mary a very powerful school to go and learn from we are blessed are those who are dead in Christ for they have reached a very high level of humility they are imitating Christ on earth now they are living and that you should reward your servants the prophets and the saints He's going to judge the dead and he's going to reward the prophets and the saints who are dead in Christ and those who fear your name small and great and should destroy those who destroy the earth destroy the earth has got nothing to do with climate change shame on everyone who met in Egypt and came up with so nonsensical 10 so-called principle commandments shame on you I don't give one penny who you are and what you are and what kind of a rank you hold in the church shame on every Christian who is taken and participated in this so-called nonsense Ten Commandments biggest lie is climate change if they stop spraying in the air if they stop playing with cloud seeding if they stop playing with those nonsense the weather is good Now I'm angry. <laughs> oh, what a feeling, climate change. <laughs> I just cannot fathom this. For Christians to participate in such nonsense. This, I can't fathom. A Christian should be enlightened because you're supposed to be worshiping the true God and yes he is the true God 
Jesus Christ of Nazareth, all glory to his holy name is the true God. He is the light of the world. He should enlighten you. He should tell you what is right and what is wrong and what is true and what is false. For Christian leaders to go and partake in such nonsense, they're either blind and I hope they are blind because a blind person can regain their eyesight. Christ can do that. But I hope they see and still do what is against the Lord. Now this has no forgiveness because they are not repenting. They know it's wrong and they're still partaking of it. And so-called Abrahamic faith. What a nonsense. What a nonsense. That is an offense to Jesus Christ of Nazareth, my beloveds. If I am the Pope, the patriarch of the church, and I do something against the Lord, no one is above Christ. No Pope, no patriarch, no archbishop, no bishop, no priest, no one. We are all the body. Christ will always be the head of the church. But it is out of his grace and mercy, he puts us as heads of the church. But that doesn't mean he's absent, he's gone on holidays, or his position is vacant. Far from it. Christ will always remain the only true head to this body called the church, the bride of Christ. He will always be the head. But when he places a wretched person like me, a sinner like me, and says you are the head of the church, it is his grace. That doesn't mean I've taken his spot. There is no such thing. <laughs> no such thing. Simon Peter, until you learned your lesson, then I gave you the keys to the kingdom, not to the church, to the kingdom. And there's a difference. Yeah? Before you're learning your lesson, I gave you no keys. What was the lesson of Simon Peter? I'll tell you. And I've said it before, and I'll say it. And Simon Peter is a saint. And we learn from him. But no one is above Christ. No one. In the Last Supper, the Lord Jesus was sitting with all his disciples. And he said, it is written about me. Written meaning it's the word of God. It's a prophecy. God cannot lie. It is written about me. The shepherd will be striked and the sheep will scatter. Simon got up and said, Lord, if everyone denies you in here, I will not deny you. He said, Simon, what you're saying is too big for you. He said, no, I am with you till death. I will never deny you. He denied the Lord Jesus, not before a Roman soldier, before a weak woman. He got scared. He made an oath. I don't know this man. Yet when you read in Matthew 16, he said, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. Simon Peter acknowledged Jesus as perfect God and perfect man at the same time. Yet he denied his divinity and humanity in that courtyard of Caiaphas house. Simon Peter's sin was greater than Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot never denied the divinity of Christ. In fact, he went to the Jewish priest and he said, this is the Messiah, it's him. But his intention was different, Judah. But Simon's mistake was greater. In the Last Supper, he said, Lord, I will never deny you. Then he left Christ no choice but to say, Simon, before the rooster crows tonight, you will deny me three times. Simon did. After resurrection, the first disciple the Lord calls to himself, the one and only, Simon Khabibi. Simon, son of Jannah, come here. Now Simon was so scared. He said, he was probably thinking, that was the longest distance he, he, was, he could ever cut, you know, go through. He was thinking, the Lord now is going to decimate me. He's going to put me to shame in front of all the disciples. And he will say, shame on you, Simon. You think you were a man. A woman was more powerful than you and more a man of you, uh, more than you. How dare you deny me? He was thinking that the Lord is going to tell him off. 
To his shocking surprise, the Lord said, Simon, do you love me? What? Yes, do you love me? Simon learned the lesson. He said, Lord, you know that I love you. And the last supper, I will not deny you. And the last supper, he put himself before the Lord. He had to fall. Anyone who puts himself before the Lord Jesus must fall. He learned his lesson the hard way. But he learned it. As long as we learn, my beloved, doesn't matter. As long as we learn. You've made a mistake, it's okay, come back and repent. So he learned his lesson. When the Lord called him after resurrection, Simon, do you love me? Remember what you, what you did in the Last Supper? You put yourself before me. He said, Lord, I know, I know, I know, I'm sorry. Lord, this time I'm a new Simon. You know that I love you. You will always come first and I'm last. Now, Simon, that you've learned your lesson to put Christ before you, now I'm going to give you the keys. Not just because you're a pope, you can do whatever. If Christ is not before the pope, the pope cannot do nothing. If the patriarch does not put Christ before him, he cannot do anything. Satan will devour that pope and that patriarch. And he will decimate the church through that leader, so-called leader. My beloveds, let us come back to the truth. Without Christ, from the highest rank in the church to the lowest, all of us are nothing. I talk about myself first before I talk about any clergyman. But this is the truth. This is not judgment. This is the truth. And if the truth being spoken, considered as a judgment, then so be it. So be it. I've got nothing to lose. Christ must be worshipped. Christ must be served. Christ must be glorified. Christ must be the head of the church always because he is. Christ must be the good shepherd because he is. We are sheep. We do not lead Christ. He leads the flock. A church leader that goes before Christ will lose the flock to Satan. Because only Christ, it takes Christ to save and protect and preserve the church. Not me. I'm a sinner. I need his help. I need his guidance. I need his deliverance. Lord, have mercy on me. Lead me, Lord, in order to lead your flock. I need you. I'm blind without you, Lord. I'm ignorant without you, Lord. I'm weak. I'm dead without you, Lord. I can't look after your flock, but you can. So help me to help your people. This is the way, my beloveds. So if they stop their um, evil doings, the temperature is absolutely fine. We've been having some good weather in Sydney lately. Thank God for a change. <laughs> nice sunny days, very hot. Those who are building, they can build a house with no mud, with no rain, with no water, with nothing. Eh? Beautiful. Let God look after his creation. So stop spraying in the air. Stop cloud seeding. The weather is good. Antarctica is preserved and protected. Don't worry, man. Jesus Christ is more than capable of, living, of looking after the ozone layer and, and whatever you are trying to do. But I pray, even if they spray, even if they do whatever, I pray the Lord Jesus, the almighty God revealed in the flesh, to decimate every evil deed, to put to shame such evilness. You spray and the Lord blows it away with a blink of his eye from heaven. Everything you do turns upside down. May the Lord decimate Satan. May the Lord decimate every evil deed done against his holy church. May every soul, every being in existence that tries to go against Christ, may they be put to shame. But Lord, I'm asking you through your merciful heart, gracious heart, and holy heart, Lord, 
touch the people's hearts to realize that you are the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Lord, I ask you for the whole world to come back to you and embrace you as Lord and God and Savior and Redeemer, because you are the one and the one and only. But through your infinite wisdom as the true divine God, when you see people will not accept you, I ask you, Lord Jesus, come and show your mightiness and glory. Put to shame those who think they can be God on earth, for they will never be able to achieve such an evil act. Lord, show them there is one in heaven called Jesus Christ of Nazareth, and your children give him that strength to be happy in you, for you, and with you, Lord Jesus. Make us rejoice to see your justice prevail and your holiness decimate the evilness and the wickedness of this century and every century, Lord. Cloud seeding fails. Climate change fails and put to shame. And church leaders, come back to Christ before it's too late. We are all sinners and I'm the number one. We need the Lord. Stop this nonsense. How dare you write 10, ten principles, 10 commandments for climate change? How dare you? Are you challenging the Almighty God? You chose a place where God chose to reveal His 10 commandments to His prophet Moses? These commandments are holy. Your commandments are filthy. Are filthy! Are filthy. Are filthy. When you have an encounter with the Lord Jesus, the true Christ, you'll realize this is a childish behavior. You'll realize what they're doing is very childish and very wicked. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. This is talking about the Israelite nation because the Israelite nation are connected to God with the temple and the Ark of the Covenant. That's how, uh, how the Israelites are connected with God, through the temple and the Ark of the Covenant. Without the temple and the Ark, they have no connection with God. This is the only way God will hear them and they can pray to Him. That's why they need the temple rebuilt. It's very simple. Because a synagogue is not where God dwells. It's not where God hears me and where God forgives my sins. I need a temple because I need to put an altar. The Ark of the Covenant has to be in the altar where I can come and sprinkle the blood of the animals for the remission of sins. But that will be the absolute blasphemy against the Almighty God. You cannot bring blood of an animal after the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. This is an absolute offense to God the Father. So. But then the temple of God was opened in heaven and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. And there were, this is talking about the Israelite nation. Why? Because chapter 12 will talk about what happened to the Israelite nation and how they got scattered all over the world in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem with it. They got scattered. Chapter 12 talks about that Israelite being scattered but will come back to the Lord Jesus in his second return. Um, and there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. When the saints in heaven, the 24 elders spoke, when the saints speak and ask God something, things happen in our lives because God hears their prayers and answers their prayers. What happens when the 24 elders prayed and glorified Jesus Christ of Nazareth? There was lightning, noises, thunderings, earthquake, and great hail. Five things. Lightning. When a lightning strikes, the whole sky is lit up. I become enlightened. Lightning is an enlightenment. When a saint prays for me, the Lord shines on me to see my filth. 
When the light is on, you see everything. Everything becomes into clarity. So through the prayers of these saints in heaven, the Lord is shining His holy light on me to make me realize my sins, my foolishnesses, my filth and my dirt. Lightning to lighten up your soul and see where your sins are and where you are offending God. Without the touch of Christ, no one will realize their sinful nature. No one. It takes God to open our eyes. Lightnings for the enlightenment. Noises that speak to the conscience and say, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't go there. The conscience is tired. The conscience has given me a hard time. I did something and I felt bad. I went to sleep. I couldn't sleep all night long. I was turning and tossing in my bed. Why? Because the conscience is not comfortable. The noises are making you not rest. That is the voice of Christ through the prayers of saints, my beloveds. Thunderings. First he enlightens, then he gives your conscience a hard time, then he shakes you. Huh? Earthquakes, shaking. You start shaking, brother. You start shaking all over. Sorry, thundering. Thundering is shaking because when it thunders, the whole ground shakes. So thunderings means something on a very large magnitude will happen in your life that will shake you from head to toe, make you wake up. Because a small one is not working. So God will use a strong earth, a strong, a strong shakening. Massive thunder frightens you and startles you. Then after the thunder, earthquake. An earthquake breaking the ground from inside. Hail breaking the ground from outside. <laughs> <laughs> An earthquake happens internally. Hail, come externally. Ouch, my head. This was the size of a tennis ball, broke my head. God, in other words, He will bring an earthquake, shake you from within, and He will bring hail, shake you from without. He will break you internally and externally. From head to toe, inside out, He'll break you in order to make you. That's the only way. He needs to break us to make us. If you don't listen, he'll break you. It's your choice. Believe me, I've tried it. <laughs> no one escapes God's breaking. No one. Because he loves us. Because of our corrupt nature, we don't want to listen in a nice way. We don't want to listen in an easy way. He'll, he'll, he'll use the hard way. He'll give you an illness. He'll make your business go bankrupt. He'll make all those people that loved you once, they'll go against you and hate you and despise you. He will leave you alone. Because before, you were too busy with those people around you. You had no time for him. He'll take all of them away from you. He'll keep you alone and he'll put you in a desert, isolated. Uh, but no social distancing, okay, please. And no mask. Isolated. He'll leave you isolated. Why? Because he wants you to see yourself in the truth. When I see myself in the truth through the eyes of Christ, all glory, it's holy name, what am I going to see? I will see a nothing. An absolute nothing. I thought I was someone. I thought I was so powerful. I thought I could do anything, everything. I've now realized for the first time ever in my life, I am truly nothing. The moment you realize this truth, Christ will engulf you. He'll heal you. And he'll say, here's the keys now, Simon. You've realized you're nothing. Now you qualify to be the church leader when you know you're nothing. If you say you're something, I won't let you to be a leader. 
And if you are a leader and you say you're something, I will pay you accordingly. Look at the church. What has become of it? In turmoil, divided, lost. Divided and lost. We need to realize this truth. We are nothing. This is the truth. God, Jesus Christ, is everything. And we are nothing. And I'll leave you with this. <laughs> Eddie, <laughs> I'll leave you with this. We have some very fast learners <laughs> with us here. I'll leave you with this. There are two kinds of perfection we need to reach. One perfection on earth, the next one in heaven. Now the perfection we need to reach, why, we, why do we need to reach perfection? Because the Lord Jesus said it in Matthew 5, 48. He said, be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. It requires perfection to enter God's kingdom and be in the presence of the Almighty God who is all perfection. It requires perfection. Now on earth, this perfection is when you and I, I and you, reach zero. Sorry, that's not a mark of the... <laughs> you know, when the first time I ever spoke about the pandemic, this is Middle Eastern culture style. <laughs> they thought I was a Freemason. Sorry, man, I'm not a Freemason. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is a, it's just a Middle Eastern uh, kind of a way of talking. You know, Middle Eastern, they use their hands, like the Italians as well. You know, oh, you, 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 you. So we go like this, you, 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 you. That's not, not, not Freemason at all. <laughs> I'll step on this. It means nothing to me. So, you need to be zero. <laughs> That's even worse now. <laughs> May the Lord Jesus decimate every this nonsense symbol. You need to be zero. Z-E-R-O. <laughs> you need to be zero. This is the perfection Christ is calling every human on earth to reach. Be zero. Why? Because there is only one that is true one. The I am. I am that I am. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd. I am the life and the resurrection. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am. This I am is one, and this one is God, and God only. When you reach perfection on earth and be zero, and what is zero? Nothing. Then I, Christ, the one and only, I'll take you as nothing, zero, and I'll put you at my right hand. And when you stand next to me, you'll be 10 out of 10. You'll be perfect. And number 10 is perfection. Perfect, complete number. In me, you'll be 10. Without me, you're nothing. Do you want to end up nothing? Be you. Do you want to end up everything? Be me. And to be me, you need to be zero to stand next to me. Unless you die in Christ, you'll never be 10 out of 10. What is death? Nothing. When somebody dies, do you see them anymore? No, they don't exist anymore. Zero is nothing. Death, you become nothing. When you die in Christ, you become nothing. Then Christ becomes everything in you. He will make you 10 out of 10. And 10 is the only number you need to have in order to enter God's kingdom. Because where God is, it is perfect. And 10 is a perfect result. And this is the only way to live with God. When I'm always zero, because he's, he will always be the number one and the one and only. Ask the Lord, make me nothing, Lord. I want you to be glorified, not me. Use me for your glory. Allow me to be the reason for people to come back to you. Allow me 
to be that lighthouse where those lost ship in that wild ocean to see the light and come to the shores and be saved. Use me, Lord, as a husband, as a father, as a wife, as a mother. Ask the Lord to use you to bless the children, your offspring. Lord, I'm a husband, I'm a father. Bless me, Lord, and through me bless the family. For my children to realize where the light is, where life is, where the truth is. Use me, Lord, for your glory. Break me and make me. Let me be that zero standing next to you. When I look at you and I say, I'm 10 out of 10, brother. Amen. God bless you. That was close. Now, a couple of announcements before we ask our beloved Nora <laughs> to sing a couple of hymns for us with her beautiful angelic voice. Um, actually, my beautiful daughter, if I could ask you to sing something now, I'll say the announcements later. Let's listen. Thank you so much, our beloved Nora. May the Lord Jesus always bless you and bless this angelic voice. Wonderful. Now, a couple of announcements before we let you go. And please, when you leave, if I could ask you to leave in a very uh, quiet way and pray for our beloved neighbor here who's been giving us a hard time and hopefully it'll be over very soon. But when you uh, make your way to the cars, please, be very quiet and straight to the car. Don't stand in the car park. Don't talk. Sit in your car and leave quietly and peacefully and have a very safe journey back home. Um, uh, this Sunday coming, 28th of November, is the fe uh, Feast of All Saints. We'll be celebrating that during the Holy Mass service this Sunday. Um, also, tomorrow it is the graduation day for our beloved Angels of Divine Heart Sunday School. It is their graduation day tomorrow. It will be held here at the church's hall here um, in the church at 7 p.m. tomorrow. Everyone is welcomed. It's not only for the parents who have children in the Sunday School. It is open for everyone. I pray that you can join us and celebrating the graduation of these beautiful angels. Man, I want to eat them when they come so little and covered their heads and they look so cute, like a grandmother at three years of age. Oh, I die for them. I melt like a candle. They're absolutely angels. So um, I, I pray that we'll see you tomorrow at 7 p.m. for the Sunday school graduation. Um, the church calendar is also available for 2023. This is, of course, the church calendar according to our church uh, throughout the year, all the uh, festive seasons and, and the rest. Uh, if you want to obtain a copy, it is available. Uh, Carols by Candlelight will be held on Saturday the 17th of December. Um, it will be from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. to allow all um, parents, families, even with kids and prams, please, I encourage you all to come. It's a festive season. We're celebrating the birth of the Messiah, the Savior of the world. So please, mom, dad, kids, all the young babies come from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. They will be um, um, play, uh, uh, jumping castles uh, and the likes for the kids. There will be food, um, uh, refreshments. So enjoy your day from 4 to 6 and then 6.30 p.m. for the adults to come while the kids are being looked after by our beloved team that are working in the church. They'll be looked after your kids. Don't worry about it. Adults will come into the church where our beloved choirs will be singing for the carols in three languages, in English, in Arabic, and in Assyrian. So um, it'll be Saturday, the 17th of December, 4 to 6, for everybody to enjoy themselves outside, 6.30 p.m. sharp. It'll be live streamed as well. So we'll start in the church for the adults to come while the kids are being looked after. I pray we see you on the day. If anybody's interested for the Christmas visitation, for the clergy people and 
and also some of the members in, of different committees in this church to come along with us to visit you at home to say Merry Christmas and say a little prayer if you're interested uh, for us to come and visit you please put your name your number and your address down with the youth group committee and we will contact you uh, in due course and let you know what time what day to come it'll be actually done on a Saturday uh, we've allocated two Saturdays it'll be after the new year there'll be two Saturdays uh, to come and visit the number of houses are extremely limited we can't visit a hundred houses in one day so it'll be extremely limited so uh, first comes first served yeah so put your names down and we'll um, we'll come and say Merry Christmas and a little prayer in your beautiful homes Sunday school enrollment is open for next year for parents to enroll their kids from the ages of 5 to 16 also we are bringing back the kids choir from the ages of 7 to 16 any mom and dad that have children between 7 and 16 we want them to enroll in the kids choir let them learn how to pray how to sing and how to praise the Lord Jesus we want to see the choir standing here and taking care of the entire Holy Mass service um, and singing for us with their beautiful angelic voices even if they go off tune that's the beauty of the child somebody sings ah the other one oh the other one e but that's beautiful I don't want to be Liberace I don't want to be Celine Dion I want to be me so we want our beautiful children to come and sing for the Lord 7 to 16 years of age enroll them into the Sunday school uh, into the choir uh, kids choir um, and I think that is it thank you so much for your attention thank you so much for your time until next Friday if I could ask everyone to stand for the finale prayer and if you have come today and you've seen somebody asking for your name number and and email address it's nothing to do with Optus um, this is for our own information just to keep in touch with you Maybe we call you one day and say we would like to come and visit you and have a cup of tea with you. So it's just to uh, touch base with everyone, uh, the clergy people, with the, with the flock, with the faithfuls. It is extremely important that we are uh, to be united always and, and bonded together. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born again to eternal life. Amen. May the Lord Jesus bless you, guide you, and protect you all the days of your life, now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved. God bless.